Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Alexandra Palace's first ever webinar, Culture Bubble and Art and Activism. This webinar is the first in a series about art and activism organised by the Alexandra Palace Young People's Programming Team. Each webinar will focus on a different theme, and this week we're expo exploring a space where art and politics collide. My name is Debbie and I'll be your host today. We'll be hearing from four really talented and inspiring artists and activists who'll be giving us a taste of their work and answering some of your questions. There will be time at the end for a Q&A, so please uh, drop your questions in the chat box and we'll aim to answer as many of them as we can at the end. We've also got closed captions available for those who need them and you should be able to set them in the menu bar at the bottom. So first up, we've got Jarrell. Uh, Jarrell Francis is a 35 year old independent art curator from Haringey who focuses on opening up the art world to young people from, from a lower socioeconomic background and a political activist fighting for social and environmental justice with the Green Party. His short film, The UK is Not Innocent, is six minutes, 41 seconds and documents the Black Lives Matter protests across the UK. Scenes include images from London, Bristol, Brighton, Bradford, Leeds and more. The film is compromised from, of images from 11 photographers and a backing track from a gospel band called A New Thing, all of whom, all of whom are from the UK. The film highlights Britain's own movement for racial equality. Good morning, Jarrell. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me, um, Ali Pali. So would you like me to speak on the film and what I do? Yeah, please tell us about yourself. Okay, cool. So my name is Jarrell. I'm 35. I'm from Haringey and I am a political activist with the Green Party. I ran in the 2017 general election in Tottenham and the 2019 general election in Hornsey and Wood Green. Um, and I'm also an independent art curator um, who uh, Debbie just said mentioned I recently created a six minute film which documented the Black Lives Matter protests across the UK. Um, so that was the first film that I, I've made. Um, we did try to test it out to show you today, but unfortunately it jittered a bit. So afterwards we, I can send you the Google Doc link. Um, but it was, a port, it was important for me to document um, the Black Lives Matter um, movements which were happening um, uh, this summer, because I thought it was quite a seminal moment within um, Black history around the world, but I thought it was a seminal moment within British um, Black protest as well. And um, we haven't really in Britain had that type of uh, positive political movement for change in my generation anyway. And I thought it was the first time that people did it. And I normally love a protest. So I, I normally am on all the protests, but this year it felt um, really heavy on me and I didn't feel that I could attend the protests for not just necessarily because of the pandemic, but I just felt um, really heavy, uh, it weighed heavily on me what was happening in, on, in the world. So. I ended up making this film, which um, I got so many great submissions from photographers across the UK um, and selected the best um, images from that film um, and put it into um, a, a six minute piece with a, a gospel band. And it's done really well. It was projected above the Bernie Grant Art Centre building in Tottenham um, last month um, over a few weekends. Um, I showed it in a gallery space in Soho um, alongside two spoken word pieces by um, a young black um, spoken word artist called Rosa from Tottenham um, and an older um, black artist who, um, spoken word artist who also documented their kind of take on um, what it feels like to be black in Britain um, today. And his name was Pat Leacock. And, um, Every time I've showed this at a different venue, you get a different audience and it's, um, it feels quite different because it's, it's projected because that's the idea for me to project it and um, for it to kind of almost be like um, a protest within itself. So 
when I kind of did the film, I made sure that the the uh, photos were coming at from at different angles and some stay on for longer than others. Um, it goes quicker in some places than others and it breaks up um, and it also intersperses with like the John Boy Boyega speech, um, the toppling of Colston statue, which I thought was a really important moment. Um, and I think um, because I'm also um, a, a, a political activist, I, I thought it was the first time that people understood, um, I, I think people did understand, but I think more people understood that you cannot have social um, and racial justice um, without politicians playing their part and their role. And I think um, systemic racism um, historically is about politicians voting to keep um, working class, uh, black and Asian and other minority um, communities in socioeconomic problems, which we've seen with the coronavirus has transpired um, into a higher death rate between black uh, and Asian people. That's socioeconomic problems. That's not because of biology. It's because um, they tend to be more in the frontline working class jobs in more cramped conditions um, in multi-generational households. Um, and I just felt that it was important for me um, uh, I normally curate exhibitions, so my plan was to curate and put on a photographic exhibition, but because of the pandemic, I couldn't do that. So I thought it was important for me to kind of use my creative eye in a way and make something which could be seen um, by other people wherever they were. And that's why I created the film and I made a Google Doc that anyone could email me and ask for and they can show it wherever they want because I think it's important that we all share um, in the kind of moment. Thank you, Jarrell. Um, so I hope people will be able to access that video afterwards um, and we'll put a link in, on as well. Okay, cool. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, so next up, uh, we have um, Rochelle. Uh, Rochelle Romeo is an artist who was raised and currently lives in North London, inspired by her experiences, social interactions and surroundings. Rochelle expresses her opinions and thoughts through the mediums of embroidery and other various artistic processes, including print and paint. She hopes to share her vision, hoping to create a connection with them, evoking thought and emotion, positive or negative. She says, I guess it's because it's lonely thinking you are the only one in the world who thinks these things or has these experiences. Rochelle, would you like to um, tell us about yourself and your work? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Rochelle, as you've just been told. Um, I'm a 36 year old artist from North London. I'm a mother of two, um, a single parent. I also work in education and work with young people with mental health as well. Um, pre prior to my current post, I worked at Childline. I'm also a trustee for Having Gay Shed, um, something I'm really passionate about. And I've been a practicing artist since I graduated in 2010. And I create pieces that are evoked by experiences that I have been part of or other people's experiences trying to um, support sharing knowledge really around. I want to show you a couple of pieces um, that I felt that will be really um, important for today's um, webinar. Um, I'm gonna start off with identity. Let me just get the image up for you. Okay, so this is identity. This piece um, was inspired by um, something that happened in 2018 when my father was sent a letter after 12 years of fighting the fact that he's a British citizen and the letter was from the Home Office saying that he would have to report to the Home Office um, so he would not be deported. Um, my father's story was covered in The Guardian and at the time I was working at Childline and I was creating art. Um, so for me, I wanted to express how I felt 
um, I was asked to do an event with Diane Abbott at Parliament and I wrote this speech um, and then I kind of took the speech and I created this tapestry whilst that between my job talking about the emotional um, impact that it had on me being um, half Antiguan, half Mauritian Creole, but born in London and then being made to feel that London wasn't my home anymore. Um, this piece has been bought by a museum. Um, so keep an eye on my socials and I will reveal soon. So hopefully you'll be able to go and visit it um, in the near future when all lockdown is over. Um, so this piece here was, you know, it really kind of embedded the emotional turmoil of being a black British person from with a colonial history being denied of being British. Okay, let me try and see if I can share another one now. It's not working, sorry. Let me try again. It's gone missing. Okay. We can see one now. We can see um, a picture on the left. Oh, yeah, we've got it now. Yeah. So this piece is a follow up um, to identity. It's called the Disowned Britain. It was that it's me expressing the aftermath of how I felt once this was all closed down. Because although the Windrush scandal is getting coverage again, and uh, you know, there's gonna be deportation against him, you know, it's still happening. Um, deport deportation flights and they're still happening. It was almost like I felt forgotten and I wanted to voice that in this piece. I'm still using kind of the map format, you know, the identity was in the shape of Britain with the red river running through it, kind of rep representing Enoch Powell's speech. This one is got the whole of the UK, it's the whole of the UK kind of speaking about my identity and how um, disfigured it feels, you know, how broken I feel from it and how it's almost kind of forgotten you know people are not talking about it anymore but yet it's still something that I'm holding. This piece is um, is able to see at the Migration Museum it's on exhibit part of the, their departures exhibition until June so hopefully um, if we come out of lockdown you guys if you're available to go and see it down there in the flesh And the last piece I wanted to show you, just to show a bit of a range of the types of things I do. Let me show this one. Okay, here we are. This image is called Rubber Lips, it's painting, and it's a, uh, it's been, unlike the other two, which was cross its tapestry, this is paint. And then the lips itself is made from rubber. Um, I'm very interested in colloquialisms and language. And I, you know, I've got bodies of work that kind of express, express that um, coming from a more feminist approach. Although this is, you know, I'm a womanist and um, this is about, you know, the colloquialism regarding how a lot of black people are tend to be discriminated for having fuller lips and it's quite a derogatory term but yet we live in a society now where people are kind of creating themselves and going through surgery to kind of build this kind of idea of beauty which was something that was always deemed as unattractive for many years so in a way it was my kind of celebration of the stupidity behind it you know of that that slur and how it's turned around and now it's almost something that was seen as derogatory is now seen an, an element of beauty. And creating this piece, I wanted to illustrate that. So yeah, so that's basically what, I'm, what I do. I do um, spoken word as well. Have you seen it's been incorporated in a couple of my tapestries um, and I also, I'm an advocate for mental health as well. 
Um, I do a lot of stuff around that and supporting the young people as well as people of my own age. I'm training to be a fully qualified counsellor at the moment too. So yeah, that's that's it for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I'm really excited to see all of those pieces in person as well. Fingers crossed we'll be able to see them soon. No, hopefully, um, yeah. I yeah, hope. hopefully. Yeah. Um, so next we have um, Kay. Um, Kay is a photographer, poet, filmmaker, author, mental health researcher and founder of the internationally acclaimed Smiling Boys Projects. He spent the past three years exploring the intersection between culture, masculinity, identity, racial emancipation, mental health and community cohesion through art, photography, educational workshops and public events. A great deal of his work has directly engaged diverse communities, minority, refugee and displaced groups of people, as well as collaboratively creating work with them. Kay, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your work? Thank you so much, Debbie, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now to give some uh, visual aid to a lot of the things I'm going to explore about the work that I do with Smiling Boys and also my practice as a whole. So can, can you see the, the screen? Yeah, we can, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. OK. Uh, let me get that up. No. Great. So as I said, earlier, um, Smiling Boys Project is one of the work that I do. Uh, as described earlier, I, <clears throat> I use multiple mediums to explore various themes. The majority of the themes I explore are usually masculinity, identity, and uh, racial emancipation um, with the intersections of, of various identities. And that brings me to what I decided to create in the last two years was the Smiling Boys Project. And ultimately, the idea behind the project was because when we think about the visual representation of black boys and male identity, this is what is lodged in our discourse mentally, um, subconsciously or consciously. These are the images that are circulated when we think about black boys and black male identity. And this, again, is why when we think about what has happened in the last uh, few months, especially over the summer in terms of the global social uh, Black Lives Matter movement, that's why it's become much more of a common practice to hear and see countless names, not just in America. We have names over here like the Mark Duggins and the Smiley Culture and Leon Bridges, as well as, you know, uh, countless names in the states of Black men who and women who are consistently gunned down by uh, law enforcement because these are the imageries that are projected um, in people's psyche of Black men and Black boys. So therefore, it's not afforded to them the idea that they could be innocent, they could be fathers, they could be sons, they could be children still, but instead there's these ideas of aggressors and dangerous human beings, even though they are totally unarmed. So therefore, for me, I wanted to create something that subversed, subverted that visual idea of Black boys and Black men. And that's what brought us to the Smiling Boys Project, which I'm hoping at this point you can feel a contrasting set of emotions from the first series of, of visuals of Black men to what we have here. And so for me, I work with these young black boys, which is based upon research that I conducted in 2018, uh, funded by the Wellcome Trust to travel around the five top five happiest countries in the world and to ethnographically explore what it feels like to be happy and what are the, the factors that are used to create um, or to measure indicators that are used to measure happiness and therefore use that to design creative uh, projects that were based on these eight pillars of happiness to improve the mental well-being of young black boys but also to advocate for a lot of the best practice changes that needs to be implemented from the education system to the mental health and healthcare system to the uh, criminal justice system as well to be able to provide an opportunity for young black boys to be visualized like this and therefore what are the factors that we need to put in place to allow this to be much more commonplace than these types of images and over the last year and a half, a lot of my work is, has been working with uh, young black boys across all the boroughs in London. Um, so I'm in Harringay, Hackney, um, Lambeth, Southwark, um, lots of boroughs across London, and I'm consistently um, uh, working to get into more schools and more boroughs. And, and a lot of the work that I do, again, you know, challenges this visual narrative has been, you know, written about and, and documented in The Guardian and, and, and uh, explores how as a national agenda, we should be looking to challenge the representation of black boys because when we look at the overwhelmingly disproportionate impact of stopping searches on black boys, they're seven times more likely to be stopped by uh, the police than any other racial 
group when we look at the disproportionality in the mental uh, mental health uh, uh, sector we think about black men being four times more likely to be detained under, under the mental health act so these are the bigger um, strands of what the the smile and voice project are aim, is aiming to um, to challenge in terms of uh, collectively challenging the stereotypes, but also trying to put uh, the things in place to be able to restructure the ways in which our systems and structures are currently, which makes it much more conducive for black boys and black men to be much more uh, uh, under incarceration or much more likely to be stopped or, or detained under Mental Health Act. So some of the statistics of the work that I do, again, for me, statistics are good, but what is more important to me is anecdotal and qualitative analysis. And I have, you know, a, a stream of those to, to document and to explore. Um, I have an impact report, which was generated, which this is an excerpt of that, which is available for people to download if you want to. I can send that link in uh, at a later date. Again, a lot of the work, when I create this work with these young black boys, I visualize this imagery across lots of spaces across uh, the country so that that it can start to generate discourse amongst the people that engage with the work. So this was at the Mayor of London's office um, last year where you know I had the, the visual images where politicians come into these spaces, people who are responsible for, for making um, laws and policies to be able to be hit with visual images that subvert uh, the visual ideas of what black boys are conditioned to, to be presented like in the media and other um, popular uh, visual discourse. Again, uh, I aim to strike relationships with local authorities so that I can also represent these young people that are, are from the same communities in their environments to challenge the everyday people in terms of what images they have of young black boys as you know dangerous aggressors as opposed to what we see here, which is cheeky, smiley, innocent, and very, uh, very young and youthful uh and this is at the brixton village um so we have a partnership with brixton village which you can see these images um uh in their spaces we also have a partnership with Wandsworth council so this is in the nine ohms area where some of these young boys who are from these areas as well the images are kind of uh dispersed across the, the boroughs so that people can be confronted with visual images that are counter stereotypical of black boys in ways that hopefully allows them to humanize uh young black boys and hopefully put things in place to be able to allow for them to to, uh, to succeed as well. Um, so yeah, these are just some visual images that have been circulated ac across the, the country in the last year. Uh, these are the young black boys that I brought to, to the mayor of London's office again, to allow them to visually uh, occupy a space and not feel like strangers in their own authenticity, wearing however it is, what it is that they want to wear, to come into a space full of politicians and seeing their faces in the building where the mayor of London uh, resides is, is, is a powerful, um, I guess, activism in itself in terms of allowing these young boys to occupy spaces. Again, I take them uh, to the to the art institutions across uh, the country. This is at the Tate, you know, getting them to, to occupy these spaces and challenge the status quo of artistic artistic representation in very, you know, colonial spaces like, like the um, Tate Britain. And uh, very recently, I, I created a short film, which I'm just going to ask Debbie if I'm able to show that. It's a two minute, 50 second film. Uh, it, it, do we have time for that? Or should I just put the link in? I think we've got time, yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. So it's a short film I created, which was um, commissioned by the Wandsworth Council about what's my relationship with the term of black history so i wrote the poem and i filmed directed um this piece so i'm just going to play that for you to hopefully get a taste of the project as the past cradles my hopelessness in its warm embrace the air of despair juxtaposes against the breathlessness invoked by an can't breathe sign. Held up by a young black boy I want to believe is older than 13 years old, but the baby here is a missing teeth suggest otherwise. For a moment, I'm lost in his eyes as I begin to see the world through it. Rose tinted glares from his favorite Black Panther sunglasses help bring a filtered optimism that defies reality. Reality is I Reality is, you know, his uncallous soft palms hold onto hope like grudges of families past, or better yet, roller coaster handlebars from a now distant summer trip to Alton Towers, where pandemics didn't alter his innocence and youthful bliss. I too want to hold onto this hope, but my calloused hands from gripping tightly onto ideas of equality that always seem to slip through, make it an impossible task. 
where he looks down into the strong shoulders of his Jamaican brown, on which she is firmly placed. He feels the wind rush through her hair, her skin, and her DNA. He feels her pain, her strengths, and her health restraints. Knowing her actions, however justified, determine how high his head is raised. I too imagine, for a brief moment, how many shoulders I sat on. How many held restraints enabled me to see further ahead than my friend Femi, who was never told his story, who was never shown his story, the true his story. Seeing through these rose-tinted sunglasses indulges me in a vision of the future, the black future, that sat firmly on the shoulders of his story, black his story. The true black history that excavates truths and holds you accountable for your lies and misinformation. The true black history that unearths pains as much as it unearths the gold many of our ancestors were slain for. The true black history that recounts our footprints and handiwork in the very grounds you take the credit for. The true black history that uncloaks the facades we are clothed in as a devious tapestry of lies. So we can continue to stand on strong shoulders, past and present. Then can we clearly and brightly see the black future he deserves to see, even when the rose tinted sunglasses come off. This is my black future. Great, thank you. That's me. Thank you, Kay, that was really, really moving. Um, if anyone's got any questions, then feel free to just um, pop them in their Q&A and we'll come to them at the end. Um, and next, we've got our final speaker. Um, last but not least, we have uh, Zita. Uh, Zita is an award-winning trade union and community activist, human rights campaigner, visual artist, and designer, curator, poet, writer, author, and vocalist. Zita is the national chair and co-founder of Barack UK. National Vice President of PCS Union and Joint National Chair of Artists Union England. She's part of the UNESCO Coalition of Artists for the General History of Africa, the founder and curator of the Roots Cultural Identity Art Exhibition, and has exhibited internationally, including at the Tate Modern and the BNA. She's a performance and published poet, performing at a broad range of venues from Glastonbury to the House of Parliament. Her book, Striving for Equality, Freedom and Justice, fuses the poetical with the political, which she also illustrated, and she's a, a member of the All Women Femme Vocal Group, Navi Collective. Uh, Zita, would you like to tell us a bit more about your work? Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for that introduction. Greetings, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so as you've heard, I am an artist, but I'm also an activist but I don't see them as um, uh, separate things. Actually, they fuse. So what I do and what I create, whether it's as a poet, whether it's as a, an author, um, in um, my singing group, uh, um, Nawi Collective, um, or as a visual artist and curator, it's always integrated with what I'm doing as um, a, a campaigner campaigning against racism or forms of discrim other discrimination, um, injustice and for human rights. So I've been campaigning for um, many, many years. Um, I went to art school as a young person. So the art has always been there and so has the um, activism been there. So a lot of the things that, um, a lot of campaigns um, that I'm involved in are using my art, you know, through posters and leaflets, but sometimes just to get messages out. Sometimes, um, you know, it doesn't have to be um, in the formation of um, a, a leaflet or um, a, a poster. Um, and I tend to create art, whether I'm, it's writing a poetry, a poem, or whether it's um, a piece of visual art about the things I'm campaigning on. And really, um, my poetry and, and my art have created um, a, a diary of events. Uh, they are actually documenting all of the campaigns that I'm involved in, whether that's intentional or not, because um, I also believe that art uh, is um, a really important act of resistance um, and that it's also an act of self-care. So as a campaigner, 
it can be quite brutal out there. Um, you know, we face um, uh, uh, death threats sometimes, and we are stalked physically and online, and um, you know, hatred directed at us because we're speaking out. But it's also tiring, yeah, and it's traumatizing when you're dealing. Um, with horrific things that are happening to people in the world that, that you're trying to stop. Um, as Shell's mentioned um, about the Windrush scandal, and that's something I've been campaigning on since 2012, before the term Windrush scandal was even um, used, and um, deportations are still going on. Um, and so today, for example, I've been, or yet for, since yesterday, I've been working with a filmmaker to put together a short video to get the message out about how this impacts on families and children when these deportations happen, um, which is used in the voice of a partner of somebody who's booked onto the flight next week, but my um, visual art. So I thought I'd show you some, some bits of art. And um, I wanted to start actually with my book. I hope you can see that, okay, Striving for Equality, Freedom and Justice. Yeah, that's it, we can see. Yeah, okay. So this is a book of my poetry and quotes, but it also has my art. And it's kind of dark in the back of the room, but that piece of art is on the wall. It's a painting behind, but I've used it um, as the cover of my book to represent um, Mother Africa. And the book is, um, whilst it's a book about poetry, it's, it's a, a book that's documenting struggle it's fusing the um, poetical with the political um, and it's documenting current struggles. So it actually, it covers um, right up to Black Lives Matter, um, but it's also about my personal journey. So it's almost semi-biographical as well because I write poetry, you know, my poetry is written about real things that are happening um, now and in the past. Um, so, and I thought I'd show you some other pieces of art. So these are kind of placardy things that I've done. So this was for, um, as has been mentioned, I'm involved in the trade union movement. So this was created for a video around um, trying to get unions to organize around all the horrific things that are happening, particularly around COVID and the impact on workers or COVID in terms of safety. Um, but on the other side, this was um, a placard I created for another video, of course, because everything's, um, you know, um, uh, virtual at the moment, <laughs> you know, ordinarily, um, I would be going out to protest, I'd be organising, coordinating protests. Um, so I was asked to create mm -hmm. a placard with four words about how I was feeling. And this was in the middle of the summer after George Floyd had been killed, but also in the height of the, the coronavirus lockdown. Tired, angry, resilient and determined. Um, so I think that art is, is really healing and it's really powerful in terms of us getting messages out to audiences we might not otherwise reach. Um, and it's been mentioned in the introduction that I founded the Roots Cultural Identity Art Exhibition. How am I doing for time, by the way? Am I okay for time? Yeah, you're fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so the Roots Cultural Identity Art Exhibition and Collective was established eight years ago by what's called the TUC, the Trade Union Congress Race Relations Committee, a committee that I'm elected to. And it was part of the Stephen Lawrence task group recommendations to create um, a platform for young black creatives um, in memory of Stephen Lawrence wanting to be an architect. So um, we started um, what was going to be a one-off exhibition, which was um, particularly focused on young black artists in recognition of the fact that they face institutional racism in um, the arts and culture sector, but also um, the fact that austerity was impacting on grounds of age and race disproportionately in the labor market more broadly. So we, we start our program of exhibitions and look for opportunities for the artists during the year at the TUC Black Workers Conference. So it's a way of bringing the trade union movement to young black artists and um, for young black artists to be given a platform 
to um, show their art, but the themes of our exhibitions are very much tied in to the work that we're doing as um, a Black Workers Co at the Black Workers Conference and the theme of that conference and the things that we're focusing on in terms of trying to um, fight for um, race equality and justice. And um, the UNESCO Coalition of Artists for the General History of Africa is um, obviously a United Nations initiative, which is a global initiative um, that was established by UNESCO because um, the eight volumes of the history of Africa that they had written were little known. And they felt like with the um, global pandemic of racism that we were facing, this was in 2015, they established the coalition and it's multi-genre artists. So it's musicians and poets and writers, it's uh, visual artists, it's every kind of artist, but artists from the African diaspora globally who are part of this coalition. And um, they establish it because they thought that all of those artists could use their platforms to um, promote the history of Africa in, as a way of actually countering the racism that young black people experience and the barriers and discrimination that they have to face. Um, because if it was known, um, UNESCO felt that there were, um, you know, um, wonderful and fantastic and incredible empires, um, you know, throughout the history of Africa, um, those who are facing discrimination may find that uplifting and a way to counter the racism that they face. In schools in the UK, they've been trying to teach that black people began, you know, enslaved. There was no history before or no alternative history, just looking at one group of people who, um, you know, which is my ancestral line, who faced that experience, but it's not the experience of everybody. Um, how am I doing for time now? Can I show a couple of things on the screen? Or um, we, yeah, you've got about a minute, if that's okay, just because we want to get onto some of the questions, but okay. if you, you I'll quickly, then. quickly just show you something. Let's hope that this works. Okay, it's not working the way I want it to work. it's not showing the window um no because of the time don't worry I, if, if i can later i'll do okay. it but yeah it's not working if we've got time at the end we'll come yeah, back to it it's fine. okay yeah yeah, yeah okay fine. cool thank, thank you very thank much you. thank you zeta okay um, i'm now going to, going to invite all the um guests to turn on their cameras and we've got a couple of questions from the youth programming team and um, which are for everyone so feel free to jump in if you'd like to answer it thank you um, so the first question that we've got from Ali Pali programming team is why is art such a powerful tool for activism? Is there anyone who'd kind of like to jump in and answer this one? I mean, I could go. I think um, yeah. what we definitely witnessed this summer, specifically in light of obviously what was really well documented, which was the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what we realized is that the reason why unlike any other time recorded in history, the groundswell and the impact of the movement online and in person was, you know, unprecedented. It's, 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 it's one of the most, you know, resounding civil rights movements that's ever existed in our, in our history. And one of the reasons why that is the case is because this was the perfect amalgamation of not just uh, online activism, but also artistic, activism where artists everybody was using their platforms and creating art in response to all the things that were happening and ultimately what that did is it empowered people who perhaps where i've always felt like actually it's not their position to be able to go out and make change happen they have to wait for the politicians and people who have you know the the massive platforms to do that but actually what we realize is that was not always been the case i mean that's always been the case but that's not ultimately uh, the bigger picture of where we can be going, especially in terms of how this generation mobilized more so than any other time. So realizing that, you know, in the nooks and crannies of your own room, you can create something that could resonate much more deeply. You don't have to be just like Jarrell mentioned, you don't have to step out and actually be on the marches, which obviously that is also one way to be an activist. But what we realized is, especially because there was a, there was a coincidence of uh, 
of uh, or there was a there was a simultaneous pandemic which was you know the, the the health pandemic as well as the racial pandemic a lot of people were obviously not able to physically join in a lot of marches but what happened was people were able to still create pieces of art were still able to vocalize mobilize and create things that had a resounding impact as though they were you know on the front lines marching so for me i think art has always been a, an incredibly powerful tool to be able to speak uh the voices of the oppressed. And that's ultimately why a lot of the, the most powerful forms of art came into existence because those people didn't have other platforms to vocalize their discontent and their visions for a reimaginated future. And so art has always provided the opportunity for that to, to be the case. But what has happened now is that power has been shifted to the hands of the common everyday person as opposed to the gatekeepers who have always been the ones who actually project what art should be put out into the world and you know that that's kind of my my take on on the relationship between art and, and activism yeah i think that's a really really um, valid point thank you Kay. does anybody else want to kind of answer that question otherwise we can go on to the next one No, okay, cool. Um, so the second question that we've kind of got um, from the programming team for everyone is um, how much does your art feed into your activism? And do you feel that having um, a creative voice makes you a better activist? Would anyone yeah, like to answer that, Zita? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, it, feeds, it really feeds into everything I do, as I've already mentioned, because I will use art in, uh, uh, you know, whenever I can in my activism but i don't necessarily think that it makes me a better or um you know worse mm -hmm. activist because i work alongside many activists who work tirelessly and fantastic campaigners but they're not artistic and they're not creative i think you need a mix of people um but i do think as artists we're in a unique position to um get messages out in quite a powerful and often emotional way um, that may not be that, that may be missing, you know, from from other campaigners and, and activists, um, and that creativity we bring um, has the power to reach audiences and reach people and connect with people in a different way. You know, a long speech doesn't have the same impact as a poem that's come from somebody's heart, and somebody might switch off from a speech but they may really connect with that poem because it speaks to their lived experience and you know they they can feel it and not just hear it thank you zita yeah i think that's that's really true as well um so we've got one more that's kind of for everyone and then we're kind of going to go on to some individual questions and then we've got some questions in the q a as well so we'll come on to those as well before we finish and um, the last one that we've got for everyone is is art your activism or is art just part of your activism and how important is it for you that your art challenges and addresses issues which you're passionate about and how does it support your cause? Um, so would Rochelle or Jarell like to answer that one? Jarell, yeah, go for it. Um, art to me, um, I when I initially started as a curator, my point was that I wanted to aim art at um, working class um, black kids from Tottenham and Wood Green um, and, and more visual arts because um, I think within the black community as a whole music is so important to us that a lot of working class black kids automatically will if they can't even afford an instrument will end up being great singers or rappers or whatever um, but I I really wanted um, young black people to know that they can pick up a paintbrush and be a visual artist um, or, you know, things which are not um, often um, given to us as career choices. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And it is because we have four million children in poverty across the UK, which is an astonishing amount. And that that figure was prior to coronavirus, by the way. So and it was set to rise, you know, the figures set, were set to rise to 5.2 after Brexit. So God knows how much it's going to be now. And when we have a problem, and one of the reasons why I'm in politics as well is I know people hate quote unquote politicians, but I strongly believe you can 
be great activists, you can do whatever, but if we are not in positions of power, we cannot change the systematic racism. And I had to make the decision that, you know, I, everyone's activist activism is different, but I joined the Green Party for social um, and ecological justice, and I think both are intertwined. Um, and if we cannot end child poverty, uh, if we're not even feeding children, if the government are voting against um, giving free school meals during a pandemic, which they've handled so badly, um, you know, a, a young child is only, they're not even going to be thinking about what career they can do. And that's why we have such high, we have higher crime rates in working class black kids because they don't have a choice. Um, the number one reason for crime is poverty. And, um, uh, you know, so they don't have a choice. But I wanted, I wanted young people to know that they can be painters, they could be photographers, they could be the next filmmakers or documentary makers. Um, so I'm still working on doing a, um, a kind of a festival and aiming that at low income kids. Um, but yeah, I think my art and activism are intertwined. And, and they, to me, they're all, if I, you can't have one without the other. And that's why I'm part of the Green Party. And I'm trying to, you know, do a myriad of things on that side, like changing the voting system to proportional representation, which will give much more representation. Um, bringing in things like automatic voter registration um, because they wanted to um, make people vote with passports, which is quite an expensive document. Um, a few people have touched on the Windrush thing. That is directly because of government policy to create a hostile environment. Um, um, and I believe freedom of movement is a human right um, uh, as well as uh, being a privilege. And all of these things to me are intertwined. And, you know, I could maybe set up this festival which encourage young um, the new uh, young black painters or photographers but if they were still oppressed by political decisions at the other end how long would they be able to continue in that path um, and that's why um, both things to me are really important and and I can't get away I can't think one is more important than the other that's my uh, personal opinion others will believe art is more important. And, and um, as Zita mentioned, we need all types of people within the movement. We need the, um, the non-creative um, great organizers within the movement. And we need the creative people and we need people who are into politics and we need people who cannot stand um, uh, politicians. And I, but for me, they are both equally as important. And if we don't get them both right, um, we end up with um, uh, a, a poorer, society as a whole. Thank you, Jarrell. Um, yeah, I agree completely with a lot of those points. If, if okay, yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, again, second everything that Jarrell mentioned, but also just talk about the fact that I think, you know, the word activism for a long time, it's always been something that I guess I shied away from because, you know, it has its own ideas, which I guess were, were predated to my time or whatever, because I think about people like the, the Malcolm X and the Martin and the Stokely Carmichael's as activists. And I actually thought there's nothing I do that actually falls or sits in that realm. But actually what this whole movement has really highlighted to me, because I never saw the work that I did as Smiling Boys uh, in the beginning as, as a as a radical activism, you know, but actually the longer I started to work in those spaces and realize actually what I was really doing was trying to challenge this, uh, the, the representation, which ultimately directly relates to the lives of black folks, um, specifically when we look at, you know, the work that, that happens within schools in terms of, you know, exclusion rates, which directly have a direct impact on the criminal justice system, realizing that a lot of the work that I do to, you know, challenge school structures and, you know, uh, uh, pre prevent uh, schools from punitive measures of disproportionately uh, uh, isolating and excluding young black boys, this is directly related to the political structures that we're looking at in the world and all the systems that ultimately make it very conducive for young black people to fall foul uh, of the of the social structure that we look at what ultimately makes crime a very uh, presentable uh, choice for, for them in their environment. So for me, realizing that actually there's a new, or I would say for me anyway, there's a redefinition of what the word activism means now and ultimately how art 
is so intertwined, again, as Jarrell mentioned, uh, with the idea of activism and and both sit perfectly alongside each other. And I just think for younger artists out there who are thinking or oh, just come out of school and thinking, oh, I'm not an activist, because that's something that, you know, somebody who's, you know, speaking with this great oration that, and, you know, really standing in front of, you know, police guns or whatever, that's what an activist looks like. But it's actually really trying to hopefully embolden those types of younger generations uh, and think actually activism is so present in every piece of art. It's just about thinking how you can link your, your core, something you're really passionate about um, to the work that you create. And therefore that is the birth of art and activism um, in, that, in that regard. Thank you, Kay. Um, we've got a question for you from the um, Q&A box, but I think we're gonna start with the one for um, Rochelle, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the audience for asking these questions. They're actually really interesting. Um, we'll start for the we'll start with the one for Rochelle. Um, someone's asked, what has been your biggest inspiration for doing art, and how have you found it as an artist during lockdown? Um, for me, my biggest inspiration, uh, you know, I think when we we're looking at politics anyway, our own being is political. You know, as Black people in Britain. You know, there's no, you can't shy away from it. It's our normal existence. And I think it's really great that at the moment that's been highlighted and it's open for discussion more so where it's before. It's something that we've just kind of dealt with and was like, this is what was meant to be. Um, so my inspiration is my political being, my existence as a person, my existence within Black British culture and being very open and honest with myself and meeting like-minded people and having those social interactions to kind of gauge and be able to share my thoughts. Because, you know, as I was younger, I wasn't very confident in speaking about things. So now, I, and then I used to incorporate more in my work and that would be like my everlasting form of communication. So that's where my inspiration is. In regards to lockdown, um, I found it incredibly tough um, as a creative because I wasn't out there socializing so much. But not only that, I became quite reclusive within myself. I'm kind of an introvert, extrovert to a degree. So, you know, I, although I enjoyed that time, I did find it really hard to create. Um, I came off social media quite a bit, actually, because a lot of the Black Lives Matter, you know, I grew up in Enfield, um, still live in Edmonton and so forth. And my upbringing here was very very bizarre because you know we education wise and stuff in terms of black cultures and things we wasn't really kind of educated at school as we know now is something I've kind of protested about and things like that in regard with the advocacy academy about introducing black history more into the curriculum rather than it just being a month um, so it was very hard in lockdown dealing with the Black Lives Matter movement and trying to be vocal and having the confidence to finally speak about my oppression as a black woman and um, then having people kind of shutting me down because of their own negative ideas. And it's because of, down to ignorance, because unfortunately they've never felt they had to research it. So it was really, really tiring for me as a creative, but at the same time, on the flip side, I was able to also connect with really like-minded people, do some online shows, but it was really unfortunate for those creatives out there, including myself, that had things being put on that had to be shut down. Um, everything was back pay. Like, fortunately, I have a, a full-time job as well. But, you know, I think for creatives generally, it was such a struggle during lockdown to have the creative um, juices flow and being able to access their inspirations as normal. So, and for me personally, my anxiety was quite all over the place as well. Thank you for talking about that, especially kind of your personal experiences. I'm sure a lot of people um, can relate as well to that. Uh, we've got a question kind of for the panel. Um, so feel free if anyone would like to answer. Um, someone's asked, um, does the panel have any advice for someone leaving art school and about to embark on a career in the sector? And what has the school of life taught them which art school didn't prepare them for? Oh, um, should we go Zita first and then Rochelle? So I would say um, protect your art. You want to be able to share it, but you don't want to be exploited. So I would also say join a union. And I would say that because I'm the joint national chair of the Artists Union England. Um, and we've only been going for a few years. It's one of the youngest trade unions in um, the UK, but there are others that we're, we're, an, we're um, a union for visual artists. 
but there are unions for other creatives and other kinds of artists. So I would say if you're going out into the, you know, the, the world of work um, and embarking on your career, protect yourself, protect your art, make sure that you, you know, you've got copyright and protection on your art and value yourself because people will try and exploit you. They'll tell you, oh, we'll give you a platform and you can work for free. But if you were a cleaner or an accountant, people wouldn't say, but this will give you exposure if you bring your mop into our office and mop it up, would they? They wouldn't say, just do our accounts for free and for the exposure, but they do this to artists all the time. And one of my, my things about, you know, in my role as a trade unionist for AUE is that we need to get people to understand, recognize, acknowledge and respect the fact that artists are workers you are giving your labor and it's not just about the end products that you produce or the gig that you do. There's a lot of emotion and time and effort that goes into creating that piece of art. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, the second part was, what has the School of Life taught you which art school didn't prepare you for and how to embark on a career in the sector? Okay, absolutely everything. You know, you learn from experience. Um, art school, I went to two art schools, but they didn't actually prepare us for anything about life out there, about exploitation. And, you know, I'm uh, 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 of an age that we face really horrific institutional racism in the industry, you know, my, my generation. And there was very little opportunities. And I think actually now um, people are a lot more... Um, uh, about running their own businesses and setting up their own collectives and working together collectively to support each other. So um, I think that's important as well to have networks, whether it's a trade union, whether you're in an art collective, um, whether you're you know, running your own business um, that just don't rely on um, employers you know, to provide those opportunities. Look at how you can create and have ownership of your um, art as well. But yes, I could go on for hours on that subject because actually um, you know, I don't feel that there was any preparation and there, certainly there was never any conversation about the discrimination because of race and gender that we were going to face out in the industry. Nobody prepared us for that. Uh, thank you, Zita. Um, Rochelle, do you want to answer? And then, because we're short of time, I'll just do the final question after that. Yeah, sure. I'll just add, I'll just touch on that. Zita covered it beautifully, everything that I wanted to kind of articulate anyway. Um, but no, it's that thing as well of rejection. I think people don't realise when you're creative how much rejection you go through on a daily basis, especially in the initial part of your art journey and your career. Um, you know, I want people to kind of be mindful of that and not always give up you know it's about kind of looking after yourself having a supportive network keep getting out there and building that resilience because the art is for everyone and where some people you know might have 10 rejections and then that one you know opportunity will arise that will enable you to you know be able to do something great. I trained as a graphic designer initially when I was a teenager and then later on as a 27 year old went to university with my children. I felt really kind of thrown pushback. Um, my name on paper when you get it on an application doesn't represent who I am physically. So there was a lot of clash in regards to how um, people interviewed me when I was doing graphic design and I was lost. But then I went back to art school to then you know, pursue it because I knew that was my calling. I needed to be creative, it impacted me. So no, I would say, you know, exactly like Zita said, building those networks, protecting yourself, protecting your intellectual property, ensuring that you're being recognized as an artist, but also never giving up and just building that resilience because someone will want to see what you have to offer. Thank you, Rochelle. I'm sure that's really useful for a lot of people. Um, Kate, um, do you want to answer kind of quickly if you can? Um, do you still do music and is this something you want to perpetuate at some point? And someone's also said, keep doing your thing, brother. Blessings to you and your family. Right. So I it sounds like some message. You know, you know, me in some sort of capacity because, yeah, I mean, I used to make music way, way back in the day. Um, but I, I guess I transitioned. I mean, what I do now is obviously I'm still a poet, which is an essential part of making music. Um, and, I, and I create poetic pieces um, and yeah, in terms of actual music, I think I stepped away from that world because I realized that it wasn't a world that was best 
conducive for the kinds of things I wanted to explore and wanted to to articulate. So therefore, I took a step away from that music. I still use it in my artistic practice, um, either in terms of working with young people and facilitating sessions where they're able to express themselves using music. But in terms of actually me creating pieces of music, I mean, I, I put out a poetry album last year, which I guess is music, but not in the, in the format of, of rap or, or the, the format I used to use used before um but yeah so so that poetry album is available for people to listen to on, on spotify it's called um miseducation of black youth and it's it's uh it's called boy on a bike so you can check that out but yeah no i don't, I don't make music in the um i guess the confined form uh, of what i used to make before Thank you. Um, so we've actually got much longer than I expected. We're not actually that short of time. Um, but someone has said, um, who are the artists and activists that you admire and why? So um, would anyone like to start with this question? Jarrell, yeah. Hi. Um, so I also wanted to add on about someone talking about the arts, their arts career and what they should do after art school as well. Um, I didn't actually study art at any level. So I did business entrepreneurship and then I worked in uh, fashion for a bit. And then, so I've only been working in the arts for like three, three years now. Um, and what I found is um, it is very difficult to get in um, if you are not financially stable, which is, so it's difficult for working class people, it's difficult for, for people of color there are a lot of unpaid internships, which I'm fighting against, and um, you should also fight back against. I didn't know about the the um, artist union, which Zita mentioned, so I'll check that out as well. But I'd also say to kind of forge your own way uh, and not to wait around, um, because, you know, you will get a lot of rejections, like Rochelle says. But if there is any way that you can put on your own art exhibitions, we've got Instagram and, uh, and people's own online platforms now people sell art on etsy and their own websites as well so we there is other ways and artists are creative and they can think outside of the box so continue to keep doing that and you don't necessarily need validation from the traditional holders of the world in this day and age um you know i suppose everyone would like to be shown at the tape or any or something one day but uh, it's not necessarily going to happen overnight so just keep forging and finding your own way. Um, and political activists, um, I love. Uh, Angela Davis always springs to mind for me. Uh, so she's one of the, um, the pinners in, in political activists and I love her writing um, and her style. And I think um, in the UK at this moment in time, um, I. I actually think there is not a necessarily that person, but I think that's a good thing because I, I found that in the summer where, um, yeah, John Boyega did his speech in, 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 the, in the park, but I found it was not a celebrity led movement. And as strange as that sounds, normally people want a celebrity endorsement, things like that. And so a lot of celebs were coming out, but I found this was better because it was a normal, people movement of all types of uh, black people, um, working class and upper class, and it was a normal movement. And I think that is important. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, I, I don't necessarily buy into the idea that there's this whole of, you know, black on black crime, and, and there's a lot of resistance within the black community. I don't necessarily buy into that. But I also don't necessarily think there's all, always been a coherent movement between everyone. And I think this was one of the first times I saw across, not just London and the UK, a real um, movement towards uh, change, genuine, tangible change. Um, and I think that is important um, for us as activists to encourage people to say, it doesn't matter if you are actually, I know we're talking about art and activism now, but it doesn't matter if you don't, have art yet or you are not an artist it doesn't matter if you just think you are a nondescript person actually your um your lived experience is valid and it's about all of us moving coherently as much as possible forward and i think that um i think that is the kind of contemporary way activism should be moving towards 
where we have a, um, a, pl a plurality of voice within our movement, um, which is saying the kind of same thing that we want um, real tangible change now, um, um, politically, um, within the workplaces, um, on our TV screens, and we want real change and, 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 and we're all working towards that. And I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. Would anyone else like to answer that question? Yeah, I mean, for me, because uh, I grew up on <clears throat> three different continents, I think, you know, what that exposed me to is, is a wide range of, of potential inspirations in terms of not just locally, but culturally, you know, I, I think from a very young age, Tupac was a, was a massive inspiration for me in terms of uh, the, the ability to challenge um, stereotypical black masculinities to express emotions in ways that are, you know, very counter stereotypical, but also to be able to, to be a live lived a live activist from the communities that I grew up in. Tupac was somebody that was very vocal about his discontent with police, a criminal justice system and how that disproportionately impacted black men, how he fought for a lot of things for, for black you know, people and black women in the society. So for me, seeing that as a, a, at a very young age, you know, was some, something that allowed me to reimagine the idea of who an activist could be and how you can conduct yourself as a, as a black human being. But also in recent times, I mean, I definitely have to second, you know, Jarrell's uh, uh, nod to Angela Davis. Also, Bell Hooks is somebody that, you know, I'm an incredible, you know, uh, fan of her work in terms of exploring the concepts of patriarchy and masculinity and how these things disproportionately you know impact black men in a different way which is a lot of work we need to be doing in ourselves but also to Tamika Mallory so I think you know black women for the most part in most parts of the world are incredible inspirations because a lot of the incredible movements that we have seen in the world have definitely been spearheaded by, by black women over time and I think you know this summer perhaps is probably one of the, the biggest indicators of all the myriad of black women and black you know non-binary folk that have really put a lot of work in trying to uh, you know emancipate black people and and ultimately all people from any kinds of discrimination so for me those are those are some of the the, the noticeable inspirations that I have for sure. Thank you, Kay. Um, so we've got some questions that are kind of specifically directed at some of you guys, but feel free if anyone else would like to answer. Um, so the first one that we've got is for Jarrell. Um, and the question is, what do you think has been the impact of the Black Lives Matter campaign? Um, and do you think it's had any change for the experiences of black people in the UK this year? Well, I think it, uh, the impact, you know, it's undeniable in terms of um, actually people in positions of power acknowledging it. Um, and I don't necessarily mean agreeing with it either. I, I think um, part of activism is to cause a friction. Um, and, you know, uh, I should be careful what I say, but protest to me is a form of progression. Um, when people say there shouldn't be protests and we, when people always bring up violence within protest, it's, it's very, very interesting to me that if a shop, for instance, um, gets raided, how much opprobrium um, from the media uh, and, and the political commentary is, how strong it is in comparison to when someone loses their life, how kind of, to me, it sometimes it's glossed over and it's treated as a kind of benign thing. So um, Black Lives Matter has been um, um, acknowledged by people in positions of power. And from a political point of view, I think we need things like um, blind CVs, which would not, so there's been studies done that if you have a, a name with an African or Asian surname um, compared to a, an English sounding surname, and you're automatically going to, it reduces your chance of getting a job. That's a tangible difference that can be made. Um, um, but also, I, I mean, I, I did mention that there has been a, a, a coherence within the black community. Unfortunately, there is still some denial within the governing party and black people within that party. Um, Kemi Badenuk is the equalities minister um, and she's a black woman but said there's no such thing as systemic racism. Um, and, and that causes problems. 
Uh, so I so I think, you know, there was lip service done within political circles just to placate kind of black people for a while. And we're now seeing the deportation, which is gonna happen over Christmas um, and other stuff, which, which is still happening, which we need to kind of, we now need to put the step up the gas again. And that's, that's the problem with sometimes with these movements, they go, you know, they fluctuate. And so I think um, my job um, being in, in politics is to try and put pressure on the politicians to actually implement things which will make tangible differences within our lives. Otherwise, it's going to continue uh, in the way we have. So I think it's had a positive impact because at, for the first time, uh, people in positions of power were acknowledging Black Lives Matter, were saying stuff. And even if it's lip service, it's, it's a, a movement. Friction is a sign of a movement. Um, and hopefully we can move forward um, in a more smooth, um, quick way. Thanks, Jarrell. Um, so we've got another question um, for Rochelle. Um, Rochelle, um, you've spoken about both racism and sexism in Britain today. Um, how important do you think intersectionality is when we talk about these issues? I think it's really important because, you know, you can't use blanket terms or factual data to kind of describe a person's experience. There's many factors that will clash and cause differences within people's experiences and you need to value people's unique experiences to be able to really get a true idea. You know, unfortunately, not everyone's able to educate themselves, um, whether it's through where they are socially, um, in terms of um, financial situations and what have you, they may not feel confident enough to expose themselves to those things. Some people suffer from Stockholm syndrome even, and you know, like we spoke about Kimmy, um, uh, Jarrell mentioned her, you know, so I think in terms of intersexuality, you need to really, you know, it's really important. You know, I'm in my impact by politics is possibly different to yours, not saying worse or, or better, but because I am a single mother, I am black, I'm um, half Mauritian Creole, half Antiguan, which comes with their own um, prejudices within because, you know, although both black countries, they're viewed very differently. Um, you know, the fact that I'm a working woman as well, and I'm impacted by, you know, financial um, issues within that, not saying my particular workplace, but we know there are issues with pay with women and men and so forth. So all these things need to be kind of considered when you're talking about someone's individual experience. Thank you, Rochelle. Yeah, I completely agree with that as well. Um, Zita, we've got another question for you. Um, so this one is, how do you use your art and poetry to strive for equality and justice? And what advice would you give to young people wanting to inspire others through art? Um, so I use, I, I'm a, you know, my background is a performance poet. So even though I was showing you the book earlier, so I've always been going out and performing my, my poetry at, uh, I've been part of collectives which focus on um, issues that are facing us and what we can do to challenge the discrimination we face and strive for equality. Um, I've showed you the book. So the book is effectively, you know, an educational tool as well as it being a, a book that you could just pick up and browse through. Um, it's a, a way of getting those messages out. Um, I use my art um, as much as I can on um, social media, in exhibitions, in book illustrations, in videos, in a whole host of things um, to, to get as many positive messages out. But I do think that um, art is quite healing. So actually a way of kind of uplifting people is to just share some positive images of art it's not all hard-hitting you know political messages there's a, a mix there and I would say for people um, you know go, going forward just create what you feel don't try and create for a particular audience or with anybody in mind create what's in your heart and soul and mind and um, you know, share it. We have, we you know, we have all of these ways, as has already been mentioned, of sharing um, what we've created online um, and using different platforms. 
um, and there's lots of events where you can go out and perform your art open mic events and that sort of thing. Um, so don't worry about what the reaction is going to be and whether or not it suits a certain audience or whether don't try and pander to somebody else, create what's inside you and people will connect with it by virtue of the fact that it's coming from your heart, it's coming from a deep spiritual place that is going to connect not with everybody, but it's going to connect with some people and that can make a difference in somebody's life, that one moment of seeing a piece of your art or hearing one of your poems and recognizing actually you're not alone. Here is something that represents you, how you're feeling. Um, that can actually be you know, a, a, a moment that takes somebody else forward when they were giving up. So just do what you feel, create art for you. Don't try and create it for somebody else. Okay. Thank you, Zita. I think a lot of the panel agree with that as well. Um, so thank you. Um, Kay, one of the questions that we've got for you is what inspired you to begin to work with young people using art to tackle big topics such as youth violence and masculinity? And how does art help you achieve your objectives? That's a, that's a really great question. I think for me, I mean, a simple reason is because that's what I needed when I was 13 years old. I'm a young black boy. I didn't grow up with my father around. I grew up in an environment where it was easy to see violence than it was easy to see somebody that, you know, challenged the, the trajectories that I was visually able to see of black boys and black men's outcomes. So for me, I knew that I was by virtue of just very lucky interventions in my life, I was able to circumvent what looked like an inevitable pathway of violence and destruction and potentially incarceration and were still deaf. So knowing that there were so many things that were not in my favor um, and then grow Growing up and being able to navigate that through a lot of, as I highlighted some really, you know, specific interventions in my lifetime, I realized that looking at what's happening in our society right now in terms of, you know, the trajectories of young black boys, when we look at, you know, the, the yeah, serious youth violence statistics, you know, a lot of the, the, the numbers are disproportionately skewed towards black boys um, uh, being victims and perpetrators of violence. Um, so for me, a lot of the, the conversation that I was privy to uh, on a political level as well as on a social level was not about public health approaches. It was more about increased criminalization. It was more about deployment of more so stop and searches into black communities. It was more about, you know, uh, all these other punitive measures, which were not really inter interrogating all the, the, the circumstances that create an environment that's conducive for young people to be able to engage in serious youth violence. So for me, I knew that as a 13 year old, the kind of people that I saw around me they didn't just want to pick up a knife and or, or pick up a gun or whatever, because they felt like it, you know, I mean, Jarrell kind of touched a little bit uh, on that. Some of the very, very uh, clear um, common denominators anywhere where you see an increased level of violence and criminality is poverty. So ultimately realizing that that opens the door for a lot of other conversations. And for me, being somebody who mental health is a huge part of my practice, I wanted to conduct research around how I can design something that not only uh, speaks to this particular need of improving the mental well-being of young Black boys who ultimately, you know, at a very young age are exposed to traumatic incidents, which have an impact on the ways in which they identify and represent and how they are socialized to to engage and dis uh, solve issues, I knew that I needed to create something that was much more holistic, not just looking at criminality as a singular um, uh, issue, but looking at everything that makes a holistic child. So for me, as a 13 year old, knowing I didn't have that, I didn't have a black male role model that showed me a different idea of masculinity. I wanted to create something that allowed young boys to reimagine an idea of masculinities that I over the last you know, five, 10 years of my life have been able to develop and challenge those ideas that I grew up uh, believing are the only truths around black masculinity. So showing up in those spaces. And because you know, in the last three years, four years, I've been working with young people in prison, young people in criminal justice system, young people in people refer units. I know that you know, the criminality is 
a window to a lot of social issues as opposed to the only um, issue that we should be focusing on. So for me, in terms of the ways in which I represent myself, in terms of even just aesthetically, the ways in which I present my identity in a space where young Black boys are not shown that there, these are ways in which a Black person can represent themselves um, coming from the environments that are very similar to theirs, you know, really allows them to reimagine the future that, that actually dispels the mythology of what black ideas can be. So for me, I think those are some of the, the main inspirations behind why the work that I do came to life because it's something I needed when I was at their age. Um, and I knew that it's it's very impactful because not just does the numbers show the outcomes, but just as I said, the anecdotal examples of just what happens when I'm with a young black boy that tells me, you know, three days down the line and say, you know what, this guy accosted me on the, on the bus stop with a knife. And I actually, after our session, I thought, you know what, I just give him what he wants. What's the, you know, it's not the worst out of it. But I, under normal circumstances, that young person would have engaged in a, in a physical confrontation. I'm at involved you know somebody losing their life but just something so simple about having an idea of thinking of an alternative way uh, for conflict resolution shows you know that that these are very important interventions that are necessary in terms of allowing young people to reimagine a potential idea of themselves that is counter stereotypical to what they've already known thank you and thank you for being just really transparent and open about your own experiences as well um, so we're kind of coming to a bit of a close now and um, we've got a question um, from the audience which is for um, everyone. Um, so this is, was there a specific part when your art became activism or was your, or your activism became art or was it always intertwined? Um, would anyone like to answer that one? Um, Rochelle, I think you were first, yeah. I'll keep it quick. I think unknowingly my art was always part of activism. You know, I think when you come from a place where, you know, you're a cis woman, you know, um, you feel liberated, you're talking about your experiences and you're a black part of the black community, in my instance, you know, but I think any artist, you know, regardless because of their um, group that they they feel their community that they belong to, whether they're LGBTQA or, you know, any kind of aspect, um, just using it as an example or part of an Asian community and so forth. I think anything that kind of is deemed as a minority group or a particular group and you create art, it will always have an element of politics alongside that because you're sharing that your story. And I think, you know, the more people are actually engaging with the fact and coming to terms with they are an element of political part of politics, the more we'd be in a better place in regards to sharing our stories and making sure we're all heard. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I think uh, Zita and then Jarrell. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think, um, yeah, but really similar to what Shell's just said, that I think it always has been, but I didn't always recognize it as such. I think that um, from a very, very young age, you know, even as a, a child writing um, poems and creating visual art, I was writing about my lived experience and about my emotions and feelings and about my culture and identity. But I just didn't necessarily equate that as being activism. But what it was, it was an act of survival and an act of resistance. And by virtue of that, that means that, yes, it was a form of activism. I just didn't know it at the time. Thank you, Zita. Um, Jarrell, do you want to answer this question? Yeah, um, quite quickly. I think that this year, I, I'd never thought about making a film before. Um, and then when I didn't attend the protest, I, I did that. So that was kind of, a new skill and what I was saying to the person in, in the art world is that you know use what's around you and just go with the time so um, that's part of it and also it's, it is difficult as a black person to that everything on um, de facto is political especially for a working class black background you know everything almost is political without you even wanting to as much as you try to run away from that um, it it, it kind of is. Um, I like the next one of the next exhibitions that I'm working on is about climate change and climate change is directly because of the Western world's overconsumption and places in the global south have um, faced the harshest repercussions of that. Um, and yeah, so, you know, 
I'm going to have to look at places and uh, where my dad's from Jamaica, my mum's side's from Antigua and Jamaica experiencing extreme flooding at the moment. Um, so, you know, it's always, to me anyway, everything is always intertwined and it's part of, it's part of our being, even if you don't want it to be um, being black isn't normal. You don't necessarily, unless you were one of the very few black people who um, were born into extreme wealth and went to Eton, you don't necessarily have um, um, a way of getting away that everything is politically um, active against you. Thank you, Joelle. Um, someone asked for our link to your video, so we put it in the chat there, so hopefully everyone can see it. Um, Kai, I wondered if you wanted to answer this question, otherwise we can kind of start wrapping up. Yeah, sorry, what was the question again? Can you just repeat that? For me? Um, the question was, oh, um, I can't remember where I put it now. Um, was there a specific point when your art became activism or your activism became art, or was it always intertwined? I think I'll just be mainly repeating what everybody has said. I think there was not a singular point, I think, from before, just the fact that my experiences where where what I truthfully expressed through page or through, you know, audio format or in most recent uh, iterations, very visual format, I think that has always been radically resistant and radically explorative of my own identities, but not so much in a conscious sense. I think only in the last, I think, two years when I specifically witnessed the increase in serious youth violence and realizing that young people that I saw five days ago were victims of something five days later and realizing actually I can't be around this and not do something. I think that was the moment where I thought, okay, I'm actively actively looking at a particular issue that's surrounding me and I'm looking at what can be a solution. I think is that is that that was the moment where I really thought, okay, I'm actively thinking about how to create something to end a particular issue that's happening. I think that was the first time when I really went back to the drawing board and thought, okay, what can I create? How can I do the research? How can I create particular things based upon my research to try and make an intervention on what looks as though is a pandemic in itself that is, you know, much bigger than just what, you know, is documented in, in the um, everyday media. So I think that was the point when I really realized that, you know, the work that I was looking to do and I was doing, which I've consequently been doing, um, has been directly a political response to a problem that disproportionately affects people that look like me. Thank you very much. Um, Unfortunately, we are kind of at the end of um, time for today. Um, we still had kind of a whole host of questions, but we just don't have time to get onto them. Um, but I would just like to say a massive thank you to the panel for joining us. I know that I've learned so much um, and I'm sure the audience have as well. Um, and I really appreciate how kind of open and transparent you guys have been about your own personal experiences as well. Um, so thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on today and I'm sure um, we look forward to kind of seeing more of your work in the future and seeing what's kind of ahead for you guys as well. Um, and thank you, Katia, for kind of doing the captions for this um, webinar as well. Um, so if people would like to kind of stay involved with um, the Ali Pali kind of programming and things like that, um, you can get in touch with us at creativenetworkalexandrapalace.com and hopefully we've got loads of webinars in the future as well. Um, so thank you again and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, yeah, and well done. Thanks for hosting, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And to Jen for putting this together. Thank you, guys.